And so I just want to, uh, if we'll have, um, you, if you look in the chat, you'll see the links to IACID, which is the International Association for the Scientific Study of Intellectual and Developmental Disability, where um, uh, the uh, Profs Brown are um, in there representing that organization in this presentation today. So we'll put the link to that organization as well as into as to the idea research unit. We'll put that in the chat so you can pick it up there. And just briefly, I'd like to introduce the idea team that's with us this evening. Um, there's Chantal Samuels, who will be um, taking questions a little bit later. Um, we can see Chantal's screen and there's Bongi Maslangu, who is assisting us with all the technical aspects. And then we also have two of our other members here. We have uh, Amani Carissa and Kati Nsebo, um, who are also here in, in support of our webinar. But now, most importantly, um, I'd like to introduce the, the way the format is for, is for this evening is um, Prof. Roy Brown is going to uh, give an overview of the quality of life as a paradigm shift in um, working with people with intellectual disability and their families. And then um, we're going to open the floor and um, Prof. Arden Brown will also join in, in answering questions and we'll have more of a discussion format. Um, you will have received in your invitation, you will have received some answers to questions that were um, raised when you registered. And we will also put those in the chat, just in case you didn't see the document. And we will then have questions around, questions and discussion around those questions that you submitted beforehand and also any additional ones. So, um, Without further ado, let me just introduce Roy Brown, who is extremely experienced in the world of um, intellectual disability. He began his psychology career in the UK in the health and education field in the 1950s. So he's got a lot of background to share with us. And we really, really value the experience that he brings to because Roy doesn't only bring the experience, he brings the knowledge and he also brings the care, which I think you will pick up when you hear him talking, how deeply he cares about the people that he works with and that he works for. But he has not been idle in that. He has also been a very active academic. He's contributed over 300 articles, chapters, books, web and TV radio interviews. His books have been translated into several languages. And if you are a parent, and perhaps if you have a child with Down syndrome, you might have come across some of Roy's work which is very parent and family friendly. So I'm going to hand over to Roy now. Right, well, thank you for that introduction, which uh, uh, is overwhelming really um, <laughs> for a life summary. And, and of course, what you notice from that is that I've been involved for a, a very long while and seen some of the, uh, the large institutions uh, in my original country in Britain and then in other countries and the concerns that have been raised over the years for how we work with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, and one of the things that I, I really need to say is that um, I don't think what we talk about in terms of intellectual disabilities is really very different from the challenges that all of us meet at certain times in our life. And I'll be talking quite a lot about that. Uh, for example, at the moment, I chair a committee in our local community on age friendly. And um, we have a number of people who uh, are helped to fill in their income tax is who are aged. And it so happens that our geographical location is changed by a few hundred yards. And quite a lot of the people with aging find it difficult to go to the new place. In other words, they have anxieties about whether they can find it or whether they can't find it and so on. That wouldn't have happened to them before they got very aged. In other words, we all have challenges. And I think it's very important not to think that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are totally different 
from the rest of the population. They are not. And they just have more challenges while the rest of us have challenges of a similar kind very often at uh, some part of our lives. And we need to take this into account. And one of my colleagues, or in fact was a, a, a model for me, Alan Clark uh, and his wife who uh, wrote the book, uh, uh, Mental Deficiency, The Changing Outlook in 1958 um, and several versions since, uh, made a film called Learning in Slow Motion. And one of the things that we actually see in intellectual disability is the learning processes which may be swift for some of us in, at certain times of our life are slowed down. And in slowing it down, we get an opportunity to actually see how the learning process works. And I shall be coming to talk about this at various points in my presentation. So if you could have the next slide, please. Uh, and you can give the next one. And what I'm gonna do is a quick review as I was asked to do uh, using a framework for understanding intellectual and developmental disabilities. Next. So these are some definitions. I'm not, they, you're going to have these copies available to you. So I'm not going to read them out, but I, I just want to stress that quality of life has a certain number of features to them of which these happen to be three. Then uh, if we could have the next, we decided that one of the things we needed was a paradigm uh, because we wanted to pull this all together. And uh, this is a definition and I will read this one, but Aaron Kuhn gave it its contemporary meaning when he adopted the word to refer to a set of concepts and practices that define a scientific discipline at any particular point, period of time. Now, what comes next is, is uh, what we think makes up, I say we because there's a quality of life group in IACID, so it's quite a large number of members and beyond that who really believe that the, the, we do need to talk about people's quality of life, and, and we need to build it as a paradigm. Now, I happen to believe that there are concepts in the paradigm which aren't necessarily the practices. The practices go beyond it. Um, but the paradigm is really telling us the principles we need to know about, understand, and practice. But then we have to learn what it is we are going to try and teach people or support people with intellectual disabilities. Next one. I would want to read and another way of putting it is that these are guideposts to support our intervention and levels of practice. And, but we should also say it's developmental. We're not there yet. It's often misunderstood. Quality of life has become uh, a, a presentation of its name in all sorts of things, television and elsewhere, and it's often misunderstood. And we're talking about a particular type of paradigm, which applies, I think, certainly focus on people with intellectual disabilities, but does apply to other people with life challenges as well. So it has wider use. I noticed somebody said earlier today when they were just talking that they deal with a wide range of children and adults in distress of various kinds. Some of these principles we're gonna talk about apply there as well. Okay, next one. So I think that's quite clear. Next one, please. So we've divided it into three areas, general principles of quality of life, principles that are around the individual, and then thirdly, the environment. Next one. I'll just say next in future. Okay. So here's some general principles. Dignity of the person and social acceptance of the disability. And we have to help society understand that. And I have colleagues who I think rightly stress that until society has an understanding about 
the range of disabilities that occur to people in society. So we're talking about the dignity and social acceptance of the disability by society at large. Until we can do that, and there are lots of ways to bring this about, and it's starting, but we have a long way to go to get people to understand the nature of disability and the effects of the disability. If I gave an example, it would be um, a, a young woman and her husband came to see me some while ago, and the mother was very distressed because she had a, a, a new baby, uh, which was obviously handicapped. And she described how she, she, when she went into society to shop and so on, how embarrassed she felt and upset she felt because people looked into the, to the pram she had and then turned away or made some comment which alluded to the disability. She was very embarrassed and didn't feel she could go out in society without some support and help. And we talked about that. But the point I want to make is that this is the challenge because it's not just a challenge for the child, the young baby, it's much more of a challenge for the mother and in this, this case, the father as well because mom and dad were working through this together. So that would be an example of some of the things we have to talk about and get in relation to social acceptance. And then there are personal and professional values. And I, I would ask each of you to decide what are your personal and professional values? There's a duty of care, of risk and safety. But if you make things very safe, as I've often seen occur in institutions and, and in other places, you prevent people learning. And I was going to come back to this later on in the sense of what happens in an environment which isn't a normal social environment to the learning process of people concerned. And then, of course, we're interested in normalization and the issues, which I shan't deal with a lot today, but of exclusion and inclusion. Next. And there are some other principles like dignity of disability ensuring that people with disabilities are valued. Ethically based policy and practice. Well, what does that mean? Based on values relating to society, but enriched by research knowledge and in person's best interest as expressed by the individual or and their chosen representative. Another example for you, I, I was invited to speak at a, uh, 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 at a conference uh, for people with Down syndrome and uh, allied disabilities, uh, a parent group that had been formed. And uh, while I was there, uh, the parents started to say a number of things because uh, some one or two of the people with disabilities have said, this is our organization. And some parents started to say, no, it's our organization. And we have to say what happened. People who had disabilities didn't have the choice to run their own organization or to contribute it in meaningful ways. That's now stopping, but it still occurs in some countries and in some organizations. Put the person with disabilities in the driving seat. And that's the important process, because if you're not in the driving seat, you don't learn how to drive. And if you're not in the driving seat over your behavior and your experiences, you don't learn. Next, please. Allied principles. Well, we've mentioned some of these, but rights and freedoms comes into this as well. And minimalization of discrimination. And we find today many, many areas where the, the issue of discrimination comes up. And how do we do that? And how do we ensure that that's provided for the environments that many people with disabilities will go to and live in? And in some places, stop them being able to live in. So let's go to the individual. There's another part of the paradigm. And there are some major concepts here. And the following slide illustrates some of those. 
please, next. So these are some of the things, holism, the, the whole of everything. We've got to link things together. It's not separate. What you learn in one place applies to another. What you have difficulty in one place may generalize to other places. Giving people some idea of the growing lifespan of people with disabilities. Down syndrome one and it's, well, when I started off, it was no more, uh, as a psychologist, it was about four to five years average. It is now in the 60s, with some living to, into their 70s. And that's true of other types of disability as well. Providing options and choices. I very often in institutions, the choices are made for people. The options are limited. For example, a young woman who wants to make coffee at, at four o'clock in the afternoon is told, oh, she can't make that. That's not in their rules. They'll have to wait to where it's made for the rest of the group. So how does she learn to make coffee for herself? Then perception. Perception drives behavior. I was asked at a conference in Australia, what did I mean by perception controlled behavior? Well, let me give an example. If you don't like your instructor or teacher, then that will show in your ability to take information from them and use it. In other words, there will be antipathy between the two people and therefore you won't go down the road or be allowed to go down the road that you want to. So perceptions are critical drivers of motivation. And in my view, when you meet someone with low motivation, it's the most challenging aspect of behavior to deal with in many ways. And so perception becomes very important. And linked to that is one's own self-image. What do people feel about themselves? And then part of our role is empowerment and self-determination for the person. Can they do what they want to do? And how do we bring that about? Or how do we help them and support them to get as close to that as possible? And then noting the point there's both inter and intra personality variability. In other words, people with disabilities are not all the same. People with autism are not all the same. And then there's intra personal variability. People differ in the time of day uh, over the course of a day and across the weeks. And that variability needs to be recognized and understand. And then there are the matter of the values that individuals hold, what they see as important, what they would like to happen, etc. Next one, please. Then there's environment, the life domain areas of life in which individuals function, health, home, leisure, community, school, employment, etc. And holism links and supports across domains relating to the individual's interests, skills and challenges. We've got to link things together. They are linked together and the order in which we may support may be very, very critical. For example, teaching and supporting to a person's strengths rather than to their disability. And why do I say that? Because experience has shown us, and this was a great surprise to us, and it probably shouldn't have been on research that we're doing, um, was that people very often did settle down more if they were being asked to do the things they liked doing, the things they wanted to learn. And we couldn't make out why when we did that and really concentrated on that by asking them and watching what they were doing, why they started to improve in some other areas that we, but no, they were not taught, being taught not being discussed with them and so on. So why would they improve in areas which they didn't normally uh, have help and instruction is? And we actually came to the conclusion that it was, but by teaching to strengths, people's motivation increased because they felt their self-image improving and therefore they were willing to have a go at other things and generalization took place. And then something that really is very challenging 
imagining the future, seeing the positive possibilities for and by the individual for the future. Uh, that applies to early development, schooling, employment, and adult life. What sort of viewing do they have of their future? And how can you support them with that? Because people aren't there just to be cared for. They are there to be supported and helped and help to build their functions and effectiveness in a wide range of domains. Next, please. So here are some others. Personal and professional values. Duty of care, risk and safety. I really commented on that. Uh, this is so important. I've had so many people say to me, we can't let that person with a disability do that because there is a risk. Well, of course, one shouldn't take unreasonable risks. But I'll give you an example of this. In, in one country, it was Australia, um, uh, an agency had insurance for accidents might occur. And the insurance company said, well, if they're going to go outside, we will not cover them in any way at all. And so this barred the organization from actually widening the horizons of the individual. And that underlines another thing, the education of external bodies which are relevant to our program or our agency, but, are, but can, if they don't understand, cannot provide the necessary options that are important. It's important for people to go into society. And I know there are risks, and I know that has to be controlled, and I know that's more of a challenge in some countries than other countries. But there has to be ways in which we simulate what goes on. Now, I'll give a very uh, example from my early career, and that is when I was working in a hospital for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and I had an educational part department. And in that educational department, they taught about money. And so, they needed money to show people and, and, and how to get change and so on. Uh, but they, when I arrived, I found that they were only allowed game money, artificial money, not the real thing. So the person with disability had two challenges, one to learn how to use the artificial money and then to be able to transfer it to real money. Now, that may sound ridiculous to you. And in fact, we got that stopped and... Uh, I managed to get an allowance of money uh, and all sorts of barriers were put into this, to the administration. If money might be lost, or your agency couldn't afford to have money like this. These people weren't going into society anyway. So why did I need this to be done? Well, we gave the arguments and in fact, we got them dealing with real money. And so those are important things. And I, I give one example, but there are many examples of the, of the kind. When I was working in hospitals and worked in other programs, very often I'd find that people did not get the opportunities to do things in a natural and normal way. And of course, this relates to both normalization and exclusion and inclusion and all aspects of life have opportunities for including or excluding individuals, and we must optimize the inclusion. Even if in an institution or in an agency, it means adapting the programs so that people have the opportunity to grow. I'll come back to this later on. Okay, next one, please. So I want you to consider over the next few days and onwards, about what your values are individually and how do they matter in delivering a service and care. If you don't think your client's going to get anywhere, they will get that perception and that will be a challenge. Um, very often that happens to people with physical disabilities. And we ran a program helping people with cerebral, cerebral palsy to in fact learn about shopping in a simulated program, having got from a local store a whole load of photographs on choosing clothes. And this was in a cold part of Canada. So winters was a tough time of dressing everybody up. 
um, getting them downtown uh, when they had severe cerebral palsy. But after they'd learned things in, inside with the actual pictures of where the, sh the items were in a store, we took them down to a store and their performance in identifying things they were gonna buy was about 100%. So simulating it inside is a good way for transferring it to the outside. And then now what are the ethical and professional challenges which we face now and in the future? There are still organizations that believe that people with intellectual disabilities and allied disabilities at birth should not be allowed to survive. And I've, I've seen reports on this, certainly into the late 20th century. And even now it's being raised again, the right to life or death. And in fact, without going into the great details, I know of one very major religious organization. Um, I'll, I'll say it was an Anglican uh, group across the country. And they commissioned a report on death and dying. And they suggested that people who were, were got severe Alzheimer's or, 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 or Parkinsonism or people with a disability such as Down syndrome and so on, weren't really human beings. And therefore they, their life could be terminated and it was a service to everyone. The people on the committee were a surgeon, uh, uh, as I remember it, two nurses, two or three people who were uh, uh, parsons in, in churches and had various status in it. And uh, without going into the details, I, my wife, who was a psychiatric social worker, pointed out to me that she, who she knew the dean of the cathedral who was ho hosting this national event and uh, saw a copy of this report. And, suggested to me that I ought to go and talk to the Dean about it, which I did. And I was invited to meet with the, with the panel that had put this forward. And I, they said, well, you meeting with us, what, what are your concerns? And I said, well, that you want people who have got certain conditions, uh, you want think it's reasonable to terminate life when they're young. Um, and uh, there were various groups that this was suggested for. And I said, um, I said, well, I'll give you, I'll give you an example. I can't understand why someone who drives a car, uh, someone who has a job, someone who looks after their mother, someone who goes fishing in the Rockies of Canada, um, why they should, uh, why they shouldn't be allowed to survive. Oh, we're not talking about people like that, they said. I said, but I'm talking about them as someone with Down syndrome. And they all said, oh, we didn't know that. And I, it's a credit to the, the Anglican communion that it, it rejected the proposal um, and, uh, and said it got to be either written, rewritten and other people have got to deal with it. But there's a further story to that that I won't go into, but I just want to point out that that took place in the latter half latter quarter of the 20th century. And those views are still around with some people and in some countries. Um, we know, for example, that there are still people who are limited by family social views. When I was speaking in Japan, for example, I, I was asked to uh, make comment on questions which were translated to me from the audience. And one person asked me, was it all right for people with cerebral palsy to get married? And I said, yes. Um, and, um, and explained, of course. And, and in, later in the evening, there was a, a meal and this young woman who'd asked that question was there and asked that through a translator, she could speak to me. And she said, well, uh, when I was uh, when I uh, grew up and I, I have cerebral palsy, I fell in love with somebody and my father said I shouldn't come out of the institution um, and I shouldn't uh, think of getting married that wasn't suitable for me because if, if this was known in the public, the family would lose face in public and therefore she should remain in an institution. Those 
are fairly recent events in the last several years and go on. And we must recognize this. And, and those come in different degrees. I've perhaps told you some extreme ones, but there are, this comes in various forms. And as we know, in certain countries, people do believe it's a punishment from God to have a, a, a child with a disability. And if IACID, that's my organization I belong to, wishes to work with developing countries, then it has to bear these types of situations in mind. Next one, please. Uh, I, I want to talk about this one a bit, um, and I'm going to give a little break in a moment. But I, I want to point out there are now known to be thousands of gen genetic variations which can give rise to IDD, and new conditions are still being identified. And in, in many of these cases, there aren't a huge number of people, but each one is different. And there are thousands of environmental conditions which give rise to IDD. And I think you've heard from me some examples of that. So genetic and environmental conditions can magnify deficits. And I think one of the things that we're learning is that the interaction between structure and environment brings about great diversity. And it means that you and I need to know something about the genetic structure of various conditions. And we should not believe that genetic structure is the, the major element necessarily, and that environment is possible. I mean, the huge changes, both for autism, people with autism and people with Down syndrome are excellent examples of groups who now receive Firstly, sometimes, particularly with Down syndrome, uh, surgical involvement for heart problems or uh, uh, intestinal problems. Once they're dealt with, then learning can go on, provided that it's done in a constructive way. And I'm going to talk about some of those later on. So basically, I think each of us needs to have some grasp of evolution and human development. For example, we're the only species with wide ranging vocabulary and detailed grammatical structure. And, and that is so important. And uh, we really do need to re recognize that uh, basically we are animals with slight genetic differences from a wide range of other animal groups. Um, I happen to do my first degree in botany, zoology, and, and chemistry. And when I was leaving and I decided I, and I won't give you the reasons, wanted to go into psychology, one of my lectures said, what a waste of time teaching you. I also have a, somebody who was a student of mine, now a PhD and associate pr professor in a university, has a child with Down syndrome. Uh, the mother, the person I'm talking about, had got a, an honors degree in mathematics and she wanted to go on, but she wanted to go on in the field of disabilities. And her instructor for her honors degree said, what a waste of time. You've learned all this about mathematics and now you're going to work with people with Down syndrome. She, she was so shocked at this that she decided she was going to get another uh, supervisor, and in fact came to me and asked it whether I'd take her on. I did, and uh, she is now in, in a prominent position. And what's her research on? The application of uh, mathematics with Down syndrome. She has a daughter with Down syndrome. And that's her research topic. In other words, she's using what she learned in the first place to apply it to what has been a, a major problem. People with Down syndrome should be able to read now in the majority of cases, but maths is another issue. And we don't know why that's such a challenge. Okay, next slide, please. And I, I think I've really said some of those things. So let's carry on, please, to the next one. 
You'll be able to read these because they'll be online. Discover the individual strengths and give these predominance with support and then expansion. Dealing with their weaknesses should generally follow when you find their strengths and reward them for those strengths and take them further. And a couple of questions, if there are some for clarification. Are there any? You could raise your hand or just pop it in the chat and um, I'm sure one of us would be able to see. I'm not able to see anything um, because I've got my your PowerPoint up, but I'm sure Judy or Bongi would be able to assist. Well, if people have comments later, you've got my email address and can get to me, okay? Okay, okay, well, let's move on then quickly because <laughs> we're coming to newer stuff. I want to give expansion examples. Next one, please. I, I've, I've, I've talked to this to some degree, so we go on to the next one. Lifespan planning. Remember, I talked about getting people with disabilities to imagine what they'll be doing in the future and try to develop that um, as, uh, as they age. Uh, and uh, choices are critical. They should be making choices, not just their parents, not just their instructors. Choices are critical to the development and, and learning and perception. Okay, next one, please. How to interact with people with IDD, speed of speech, volume of speech. Yeah, do, how do we talk to people with disabilities of any kind, particularly IDD? We did some recording of instructors a while back. We found that if people don't understand something, uh, instructors tended to talk faster at them. And they also talked louder to them. Being aware of what one does is important and therefore recording yourself on occasions to see how you present information. Because the faster you go, as you'll see in a minute, the worse things get in terms of the person's ability to cope. What happens to behavior is something is new or difficult. Well, people go downhill and we, we will come come to talk about that further. How do we know they are interacting with us in an auditory, visual, tactile way? How do we find out why they may regress between modality and another? How should we arrange support? How do we perceive anxiety, depression, and so on? Okay, the next one, because we're going to deal with some of this uh, rather quickly. I think I've covered much of this. Um, uh, it is also I uh, just stress the need to understand uh, variability, but I have referred to that earlier. Um, clarity of speech and decibel levels are important. Clarity of speech being how they're spoken to, as well as how they speak themselves, and normalize uh, environment as much as possible. And if you don't, uh, if your society is dangerous outside, then try to simulate, simulate a normal environment as you can inside so people can go on learning. Um, by that way, at a crude level, that saves government monies if people start to function for themselves. And of course, there are a wide range of variations. Some people are extraordinarily disabled and some of this is difficult to apply. And to a lot of people who may look quite uh, disabled, but in fact are capable of a wide degree of learning. Next slide, please. I talked earlier about how people perceive their teacher and what that does to them, how a parent perceives how she is seen in public. I've discussed that. So let's go on to the next one. I just want to comment that behavior goes from concrete to abstract. For example, it's abstract if you expect people and try to help them imagine what they're going to do in the future. Concrete is the straightforward things in front of us or what we hear at the time. And the words we use in, in, individually are concrete or they're abstract. 
And the abstract dimension tends to be limited quite markedly in many people with intellectual disabilities. So even if they we move on to abstract thinking, very often stress moves them back again that causes regression. Um, next slide, please. I'm not going to talk to this at this stage because I'm short of time. Let me go to the next one. So five, five steps in intervention. Start from the place the person sees as most important themselves. Provide opportunities to move forward. Follow the person's choices on how to proceed in one shape or form or another. Shape interventions that will improve self-image. Self-image is damaged, your performance is damaged. Encourage and support empowerment. All of this will increase happiness as a rule and make people, enable people to be more productive in their everyday activities. Next slide, please. Right, I wanted to put in some of the things people choose to do. Here's a young lady who's got intellectual disability. She'd wanted to do some sky flying and so she was put in the seat of this with an instructor, and that's what she did. Was she anxious? Look at her face. She is thrilled at being able to do what she's chosen to do. Next one, please. And here's a crowd of people who've all got disabilities. They're going out snorkeling. They look happy? Yes, they look happy. They're getting choices to do what they like. Next one, please. And some things are risk-taking, and there are many agencies who wouldn't probably let someone do this, even though they would have support and learning. Nor should everyone do it. But this guy, that was one of his choices, and that's what he learned to do. So broaden the things that people can actually do. Next slide, please. I want to talk to this because it's important. There's a study we did a while ago in 1970 but it still stands today. This was a group of very young children, about four to six years of age, in a regular school. And we divided the school classroom into two groups. One who would stay in the familiar classroom, though the black dots, where both groups would start. You can see that at the beginning, and that's their score in relation to the number of words they could produce in the situation when asked basic questions. Um, and the space spots are those who are removed to an unfamiliar environment, i.e. the room next door to their classroom. It wasn't the usual room they were in. And you can see how the number of words produced are much lower in the familiar situation to the uh, much lower in the uh, unfamiliar conditions than they are in the familiar conditions. And at the end, we swap them around. So the people in the new room will move back to their classroom and the people who were in the classroom were put into the other room. Just changing a person's room when they're young alters the number of words they have got available to them, uh, the extent to which they'll talk at all. Uh, but we also did this in relation to tasks, puzzles and things like that. And again, we found the number of movements made and the number of attempts made followed the same pattern. Unfamiliarity is a major problem. One example of that, an extreme one, which has changed over my lifetime, but when young children became ill and had to go to hospital, parents weren't allowed to stay with them. That produced a lot of behaviors. And we went through this with our young daughter, actually, when I first went to, to Canada in the late 1960s. And uh, she got, um, when we arrived, she quickly got influenza and, uh, and had difficulty breathing. So we took her to hospital. And she said to me, my young daughter, as I carried her in, she said, Daddy, you won't leave me here on my own, will you? And Daddy said, no, I won't leave you here on your own. But then to my great surprise, and my wife was with me, um, uh, the matron uh, came across because we were saying, well, if she's staying in, we, of course, will want to stay with her, one of us. And they said, oh, you can't do this. And the matron said, oh, they get so quiet, they go to sleep easily, and they're very comfortable. And we said, yes, we know that. But children who are in an unfamiliar environment and are unwell, 
they don't, and they're young, and they don't have their familiar support of a parent. Yes, they'll be quiet, but afterwards they'll have more nightmares. They have more urinary problems. Um, they will have nightmares to a greater degree, and they will be more withdrawn. And that's documented very, very clearly. So I want to make a big point about familiarizing people in environments. And I'm going to give you another example of a, a young woman who we taught to use the telephone when she was in the institution. We took her downtown and taught her how to use the telephone downtown in one of the kiosks in the street. She thought she could do it now on her own. So we let her go. And eventually, with the help of someone else, I got a phone call saying she, she was stuck downtown and she was in tears. So I went down and got her and she said, well, I became frightened, she said, on my own because all the people were staring at me. Now, I had a, a, one of my, my lecturers was a man called Herbert Gunsberg, who's no, very well known for making social intervention techniques. And he said he came from Germany before at the beginning of the Second World War and uh, to Britain. And he, um, he said, you know, being disabled is like being a foreigner in a foreign country. And I didn't quite understand that, its impact and its breadth until I came to Canada. And I was in a street telephone box and uh, I pulled out my money for a slot machine. And Canada has, I think, a rather odd process whereby its more expensive coins are small and the less expensive ones are large. And I got muddled and uh, I didn't know quite which ones to use. And I looked outside and I said to myself, why is everybody looking at me? So this type of unfamiliarity, this type of stress has to be taken into account by gradually modifying situations, by helping people know what to do. Supposing somebody's ready to go to a job, have you, have you taught, her, taught them how to have an interview? Well, I used to do this regularly with people with intellectual disabilities who might be moving out to work. So I'd give them a mock interview. One young man who was doing quite well, I interview and I say, well, why would you want this job? And he says, well, why would you think? And I had phrases which are totally inappropriate for interviewing. You've got to teach people <coughs> with that. Next slide. This is an important one. Uh, it's the work of a man called Ziegler. And those crosses are people with disabilities, intellectual disabilities. And you'll notice there are a lot of these X's before you get to actually learning the task that you have. And at this point, uh, they then suddenly rise in a similar way. One of the problems in learning for many people, and particularly people with intellectual disabilities, learning new things, is that they're not aware of the cues they've got to respond to. And once they know what the cues are, which tell them what to do, then they can carry the task out. And once you do that, you find that they follow the learning curve very steeply. If they don't know what to do with a load of parts in front of them, until they've been shown how to do that. And that's got to be generalized so that they get to a stage where they can make decisions about, <clears throat> excuse me, what is relevant here. Uh, they then follow a normal pattern of, of learning. Now that's, that's a very important aspect of why you're a slow learner to begin with and that later on you can improve. Next slide, please. I wanted to talk about this uh, because um, this is a task that gets more and more difficult, difficult. It could be any type of task. We use a particular form of task. And we found that um, when people started off with the task, they, they, they looked, tried to look at what they were doing and so on. And relevant language, they spontaneously did. They talked about things. But as a, if you increase the task difficulty, 
the relevant language went down and their irrelevant language increased. And when I talk to students, I say, when this irrelevant language happens, what are they learning? And several students say, well, they're not learning anything. And I say, yes, they are. They're learning how to be ir irrelevant and inappropriate in the learning process if you make the task too difficult for them at any particular stage. Okay, I know I'm moving fast, but I know I've not got much time left. Next one, please. So if we can summarize this, increasing environmental stress leads to decreasing positive self-image, which can be rectified by increasing, increasing structured training, being with them, getting someone who knows them to be with them, uh, providing them with early learning skills, may giving us support because they like dogs and they have a pet dog or there should be a pet dog. And will your agency allow them to have dogs on the premises, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, next one. Uh, I want to talk for this to a, a few moments. Uh, I think one of the things that we don't take into account that genetically and environmentally, all of us seem to follow the pattern of development in terms of uh, evolution. In other words, it appears that sense of touch uh, in the first types of animals appears as it is with very young children tends to be tactile. And then visual comes to play a more important part. And in the end, as you mature, auditory processes become important. So what happens if you're an adult or, or a younger child, but if you've reached a level where you, you use auditory information like talking and speaking with people and feeling comfortable in doing so, um, what happens if the stress comes into the situation? The familiar becomes unfamiliar. That would be one example. Not being well would be another example. Having an accident in the car would be another example. So when those things happen, what happens to the person's language? Let me ask you, what happens if somebody has a car accident and someone goes to help them and they're injured? What sort of things tend to occur? Well, when I've seen situations like this, people generally drop from advanced skills of language down to very basic words in talking to the person. And in fact, they make use of tactile responses like touching them or putting their, their hands ar around their shoulders and try to be comforting. That's a normal human positive response because the person who's affected has lost the ability to function well in an auditory level. And they're not paying attention to visual cues around them to any degree. Uh, so they rely on tactile. Now, this happens to people with intellectual disabilities in a normal learning situation. And so um, it's interesting to me and worrying to me that we went through in this country and in other countries, some other countries, that notes were sent round by education authorities and others to say teachers should not touch children in any way. And in fact, an example for me took place in Toronto, where Ivan lives, um, when a person who had been in a two-day seminar with me came in the second day and said, um, when I got to my office after coming to you, um, I had a note on my desk from my supervisor saying that it had been established that there could be no touching between the professional and the child. And she said, but I'd said the opposite. And I'll defend that opposite because I believe people go into tactile mode and to help them develop with a, in their behavior, very often touching them on the arm, perhaps holding their hand or just giving them a hug under appropriate circumstances <laughs> is an important thing to do because when you do that, there tends to be a move to greater visual and be better better auditory communication. 
tactile is basic to all species and it's important, very much important to us as human beings. And it's more important for people who are in distress or challenged or difficult. The next slide, please. Okay, then this is the last one I'll do. It's rather different. Um, it's some work that was done by a colleague of ours, Megan Edwards, um, and she carried out a study in which I was uh, supervising at that time, or advising on, I better say, rather than supervising. And that is the types of food that is given to people in, in, in centers, who, the quota for, quota for people with disabilities. The blue is the Canadian uh, recommendations for the amount of uh, these various things, milk, fruit, vegetable, grains, snack foods, etc. So the red, the blue is what is recommended. These are the recordings in red that we made over a period of time that they actually received. So the moral of that is bear that in mind because people without appropriate nourishment are going to function at a much lower level. You need to get up to what is required for doing this. Um, I think I'll call that an end to my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. I'm just going to stop sharing and then we can just move on to any comments and questions. Um, there are questions in the chat, Chantal. Okay. Thanks, Bungi. Um, so I just want to mention firstly that um, we, that uh, Roy responded to all the questions that were posted in the registration form. And that will post in the chat. Bongi, will you post that in the chat for us? Yes, so you... I've, I've already done that. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. So um, we did send it out with the link, but if you didn't receive it, it's available in the chat as well. And then um, we can go to a few questions in the, in the chat. Um, I see they are quite. So I've got one comment and possible question from EK. He says, I always find fascinating ways disability can help transform education. Your comment that asking people to um, do what they like and as such seeing improvements in other areas that they complete without support just shows how generally in education, pedagogy can improve to support students with different challenges better not only those with disabilities. Well, as I've heard that, the person has the message and, uh, and sees the challenges and uh, uh, is a matter of learning for many people how to bring that about. And that's what we've been discussing. I don't know whether Ivan would make a further comment. Uh, I guess I would only say about, uh, uh, you know, about schools and learning in general that, um, that what you said, Roy, earlier was uh, an important thing to stress. I think that uh, that uh, we need to provide learning opportunities that reflect the person's own interests and their their values and so on. Uh, and in addition to that, I would uh, just suggest that what we need to do in schools is to um, remember that a great many of the skills that people have, particularly social skills. Um, are, are picked up kind of incidentally by non-disabled children. And uh, children who have various kinds of disabilities often need direct te teaching in uh, different kinds of skills that, um, that we would just not even think to include in schools or even in the home when we're teaching. So I would emphasize that. Could I, I just give you one little example of how you sometimes have to modify your behavior. And this, this comes not with someone with a disability, it's my kids as they were growing up. And they would come in on a wintry day into the house from school and they'd take off of their clothes, which got snow over them and just put them down on the ground. And on several occasions, we asked them to shake them outside and hang them up on a hook. It seemed this message did not get across. And I thought, well, I'm a psychologist. So I've got to be able to solve this. So what I did the next time they came in and dumped them on the clothes, I didn't say anything. I just pointed to the clothes. And both of them at different times said, oh, sorry, dad. 
we'll, we'll hang them up now. In other words, nonverbal education is very important and can solve some problems. So don't forget that you can point and you can add a few words or not add a few words, but if you get stuck, visual impact becomes important. <clears throat> Relates to the slide I showed in the drop of behavior under certain beha circumstances. Thanks, Roy. Thanks, Ivan. I've got a question from Kofi. He has his hand raised. Kofi, would you just, would you like to um, unmute yourself? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I really enjoyed this presentation. Thank you, Roy. Prof. Thank you. Um, the question is, you know, you were talking about where to look at the interest of a child with ID so that we build, we take it from that angle. Can we have a schooling environment where we only consider what the child can do? For instance, the child with ID can swim so that we allow him to do only the swimming and progress from stage to stage to graduation where such a child I mean, I've been graduated from a skill of swimming. Thank you very much. I think your point is very well taken. Um, I, 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 I've added a reference uh, in a, with a, a book by a man called Manuel Guerrero and myself, we were editors. And in that um, I was able to get published something I'd written on leisure time. And there's a chapter, it's about Down syndrome, but it can apply to anybody. Uh, and what you've just said fits into that picture. So you might want to get that reference. It's going to be sent out to you, the references. And it's by Manuel Guerrero and myself. And it's bang on the area you've just talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I could uh, just uh, make a little comment uh, there as well, Roy. Uh, thank you, uh, Kofi, for the uh, interesting uh, question. Um, I, I was uh, d just thinking that, uh, that what you suggested is a really, really good idea. At the very same time, um, we, we have, I just want to refer back to something Roy said earlier about uh, imagining the future and, and think it, thinking abstractly into the future. This is a, a, a skill that, uh, that a lot of young children develop in in uh, early school years, particularly through imagination and and uh, fantasizing and so on, and I, I'm, in my work with adults with or young adults with uh, developmental disabilities, uh, I found that um, that uh, many did not have that skill, or if they did, it was extremely uh, limited. And um, I in I, I was working as a counselor, and I spend a lot of time with some people trying to help them think, just imagine in their heads something that they weren't seeing because the most of the answer I got was, you know, would you like to go to a movie or would you like to see this movie? The answer would be, I don't know, I haven't seen it yet. So the, the ability to be able to imagine what something might be like uh, is a skill that really needs to be developed. And uh, so in schools, um, we need to pair that with offering opportunities for them to experience new things. Uh, so there are two things here. One is if you do it even, or if you do a little bit of it, then you kind of get an idea of what it's like. So this is moving from the concrete into the imagination, but also the skill of being able to imagine something and carry that imagination on is something we have to, we have to actually teach some children how to do and adults. Thanks, Ivan. Um, so Ezekiel and Ike are referring to something similar here. So what I'm going to do is I'm first going to, um, I'm first going to go to Elizabeth's question, yes, and then I'll move on to Ezekiel. I think. So Elizabeth says, I'm interested to know if the Profs Brown are familiar with universal design for learning, and if so, can they please comment on UDL in relation to its potential benefits for learners with intellectual disabilities? 
I'm afraid I didn't get some of that. Could you repeat it? I'll do that. So she says, um, she was wondering if you're interested in universal design for learning. And if so, if you could please comment on UDL in relation to its potential benefits for learners with intellectual disabilities. Um, uh, maybe I, I could start, Roy. Uh, okay. um, the, uh, the question of uh, universal design in, in teaching and learning has uh, become very popular recently, especially with the integration of uh, children with, uh, with various disabilities into, into regular classrooms. Um, I, I, I think this is something that teachers really need to have a lot of training on. Um, I mean, it's... I'm, and the basic idea here is if you're teaching a science lesson, you, you can teach it and you can teach the lesson, but your ch children are all going to be at different levels of learning. And you have to, as a teacher, be, have assessed that and know what children can individually take out of the lesson and move their own learning ahead. Um, so, I mean, it's a very, very good idea, but uh, I was a teacher for eight years, and it was my first career. And it's kind of difficult to do that when you have like around 30 children all there, and you're trying to move the lesson along, and you're trying to, um, uh, you know, evaluate and manage the classroom and manage your your content and all that kind of stuff. So it, it it's very complex, and uh, I think teachers aren't trained quite enough in how to do it well. Um, and I'd like to just finish by stressing the point I just made earlier is that what teachers sometimes assume children can learn, they don't necessarily always have the skills to be able to do that. So the, the very skills that they need to be able to access um, universal design is uh, sometimes um, some, uh, something that you need to take into account too. Okay. That's it. I, I think I, I, I don't disagree with that, agree with it, but I, I, I want to raise a question for you all. And that is, um, to what extent do you have in your area of work teaching aids? Uh, because that can be very helpful to other teachers. It can sometimes be a challenge because teaching aids learn a lot about the practicalities of dealing with the types of challenges that people with disabilities have. When I was at the uh, Flinders University in Australia, uh, and I was um, 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 responsible for the area of special education, amongst other things, uh, I struck a, gov a deal with the government, uh, uh, Department of Education, to put on courses to train people as teaching aids to deal with the challenges of, of learning. Um, and they were so successful. The government paid for this actually, paid the university for doing it. Um, and we did them on all sorts of topics. How do you cope with autistic behavior? How do you cope with um, aggressive behavior? How do you cope with teaching certain skills? And these can be very, very helpful, not only because they have a specific knowledge about disabilities, which all teachers don't necessarily have. Um, and so that's something to look into if you don't have that within your particular uh, range of uh, learning in, 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 in your schools or in, in, in your universities. Very, very important and very, very necessary uh, and can be uh, extremely supportive. In some fact, we had a lot of mothers whose children had grown up who took those courses. And I was so impressed by the fact that having developed mothering skills, they in fact had already had a wide range of skills that could be applied for helping these people survive and, and in fact develop. Thanks, Ivan. So we only have a few minutes left. I'm going to move straight over to Ezekiel's comment or question. Ezekiel says the idea that we can apply our other academic capacities into disability and change the view of society is quite striking for me. 
I ever do wonder the best way to approach barriers of working with other disciplines because I find them too rigid to move, especially those <laughs> with or in power. Um, um, uh, if I could just mention quickly what Ike says, Ike says Ezekiel, I was really thinking the same. I came from information technology and I often got asked why, disab why disability and at those times, I didn't have an answer, but to say I wanted a field where I could work more with people, emotions, feelings, and perception. Now I'm helping pushing disability into ICT. Um, perhaps I'll just make a brief comment, and I'm not certain whether this directly answers the question, but it does. The question itself reminds me of the fact that there are now programs in many countries or several countries that uh, have enabled young adults with intellectual disabilities to go to university, even as uh, uh, sitting in with um, classes, uh, which is voluntary, but allowed and agreed with the university. They may get credits for individual courses. They may go further to take degrees. And we have a number, know of a number of people with intellectual disabilities who now have qualified degrees or certificates. But the most important thing that was done was that they were paired with other students without disabilities who became mentors and supporters of these people. And they've been very successful, some of these programs. And I think I made reference to it in um, a, a particular volume uh, on Down syndrome and other disabilities by uh, Anne Hewson and Bruce Uditsky who in fact ran programs of this type and, and uh, served as ex examples for other people. So I think we have to remember that and could apply much more of that in ordinary schools uh, because that's how you get to know people because attitudes of students who come in to learn about education often resent the idea that they've got to take a compulsory course in special education and disabilities. As a, one young man said to me, I didn't come here to learn about people with intellectual disabilities. I want to be someone who teaches physics. Well, that alone is not on today. If you're going to many, many schools, you really need <laughs> to know how to handle issues mm. of special education. I'm not certain that answers the question, but maybe it's relevant to it. Ivan. Uh, it, it, it is highly relevant, uh, Roy. Um, yeah, I just wanted to point out that uh, that the, the the changing of attitudes and the changing of uh, paradigms really uh, outside of our, it, it's difficult enough within our field, but uh, when you go outside of our field, uh, we have, you know, we meet a lot of resistance or, or we meet a lot of apathy, you know, people just, you know, think this isn't relevant to me. It's just exactly what you said, Roy, uh, about uh, the teacher who wanted to teach physics. Why should I learn about disability? The, as we have uh, noticed from, from other fields, particularly feminism and uh, uh, racial equality and uh, gender identity equality, in particular, those, those three general fields, changing societal views uh, can take a long time and be a, be a very long road and sometimes a bit of a rocky road. And um, we're experiencing that now in disability, uh, which kind of has followed along with, with those other identity um, uh, 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 movements. And um, it's gonna take some time, but it takes a lot of advocacy. And the more we can train our young professionals in how to be good and effective advocates and how we can train people with disabilities themselves to be more effective adequate, er, advocates, uh, okay. But uh, we have a little tension here I want to just mention, and that is uh, self-advocacy. Not everybody wants or has the time or the skills or the interest in being a self-advocate. Um, they have enough trouble. Some, as one woman said to me, I have enough trouble in my life without trying to advocate for everybody else. Uh, 
we need uh, the people with disabilities need allies, but at the same time, we have to be very sensitive to uh, understanding that this is their story, their experience, and their lives. And that's a very delicate balance for all of us who are here today, because um, uh, we, we need to understand both of those things uh, at the same time and find the good balance. Sometimes people outside of our own discipline don't understand that balance. And it's, it's a little bit of a challenge for us to be able to communicate that in effective ways but we have an obligation to do it. And I would put it to all of you and to everybody who ever hears me talk about anything is that we have, we have a personal and professional obligation to do it. Uh, we really need to move that forward. Thanks, Arvin. Um, so we do have one or two more comments in the um, chat, but I think that um, we should wrap it up now. Um, and I just wanna say thank you so much firstly to Roy for preparing and it's always so informative just sitting and listening to it and I'm looking forward to the next one that we have and thank you so much Ivan for taking the time out to prepare those responses um, like I mentioned earlier on I really enjoyed reading those and I'm sure that the participants will as well. Um, I might be missing it Bongi but I don't see the reference list or the um, or the uh, responses in the chat. Um, I'm just I'm just mentioning that just in case it hasn't been posted to the chat. But thank you so much, Judy. Would you like to add anything? Just to follow on what you're saying, Chantal, Bongi and I have been chatting to each other and seeing that the documents are not coming up for some reason or another. So what we'll do is we'll email them to the list. We've got the, the list and we'll just email the uh, set of responses to the how to cope, how do you cope with guidelines that Jean was asking for and also the references from Roy. So on that note, I'd just like to say thank you so much, um, Roy, for getting up early and uh, presenting quite a marathon, which we really, really enjoyed. You know, it's, it's just lovely. I just love the breath that you bring to the topic and the depth so mm. that it's so much more, it's so interesting rather than just hearing facts and figures and that, but the, the experience that comes through. So I think we really, really appreciate that. And thank you also to, to Ivan for the, um, for, for the, uh, the adding to that wonderful experience. And I would also use this um, goodbye to uh, promote our next webinar, which I think is the 20th of April, if I'm not wrong. I think it's 20th of April, right? And we will be sending out invites. And on that one, we will be um, looking a bit at how at, um, quality, and I'm just going to nod if I'm not, uh, saying the right thing, quality of life tools and instruments that would help um, those of you who are interested to actually apply these principles in the context in which you work. That's correct, Ivan. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with assessment in a more general way than just the tools. Yeah. Okay, great. So I think that's going to be great as well. So uh, thank you, everybody. And, uh, and yeah, thanks for spending the time with us. I think it's been great. <laughs>